Good afternoon and welcome to Archives UK and Historic England talking about how they're going to use drones and how they do use drones in multiple disciplines. Historic England, for those who don't know, are the public body that help people care for, enjoy and celebrate England's spectacular historic environment. And I think we can all say that it really is spectacular. Historic England values uh, include passion, learning, openness, responsibility and collaboration and it's with this in mind that the drone team's here today to share what they do with us. Uh, they are ably led by Gary Young uh, and include Alan Bull, David Knight, David Wenton, Leon Marsh and just chatting to them earlier between them they've got the, we reckon about a hundred years worth of professional experience between them which I don't know about you, I think it's a really pretty impressive for any team in this environment. So I am going to hand over to you now in a moment, two seconds, questions into the Q&A box and we will go through them at the end. Thank you very much. Okay, uh, good afternoon. I hope everyone can see that screen. Um, so yeah, as uh, as Eleanor said there, we're gonna go through how we're using drones at the moment within historic England. Um, basically, we view them as a, a tool to add to the work we were already doing. So they're providing us with a, a relatively easy way of getting a sensor into the air. And um, so we're gonna give you a quick overview, various different parts of the, the business, and I'm gonna emphasize using the drones as simply another tool in the toolbox, if you like. So I'll be the first speaker. So I'm a professional land surveyor with 50 years experience in land surveying. Um, graduated Newcastle University with a surveying and mapping degree, and then worked in the commercial sector for an engineering consultant for 11 years before moving to where I undertook my drone qualifications and then helped develop our operational procedures. And I'm now the, the lead drone pilot at Historic England. Uh, our second speaker is Dave Went. Hello. Hello there. Yes, I'm Dave Went. I'm, uh, I'm the landscape uh, principal in Historic England these days, responsible for the archaeological survey and investigation team across the country. I probably represent about 35 years of that 100 years worth of experience just on my own. I've been around for quite a while. My degrees go back to the middle 80s and I've worked in a variety of archaeological positions including development-led archaeology university work and of course uh, national and local government. Um, I'm still uh, occasionally digging but more or less I'm uh, a surveyor by, uh, by profession these days and I came into the drone world back in about 2019 when we realized that the hands-on use of drones was just becoming essential to the work that we do. And I've now found myself to be the accountable manager at Historic England for our drone team. So that, that's me and I'll pass on to the next one, Gary. Thank you. And Dave Knight. Thanks, Gary. Um, so yeah, I'm Dave Knight. I'm uh, an investigator within the aerial survey team in York. Um, quite a lot of commercial uh, backgrounds and experience going back a couple of decades at least. Um, but it's very much working with the same kind of products that you will get from drone imagery uh, for many years. Uh, and now just using the drones is basically a new platform to provide more detail in that. Thank you. Thanks, Dave. And Alan? You're on mute, Alan. Hi, I'm Alan Bull, and I'm one of the five staff photographers for Historic England. Um, so I cover the whole of the north of England, which as you can see is about 14 and a half thousand square miles. So it's a big old patch when people say when you're in the vicinity, could you just pop to somewhere that's 150 kilometres away? So uh, my life is spent running around <clears throat> up and down the country and then processing the work I do for media deadlines, BBC, national press, uh, academic books, so still photography and moving image, largely. So uh, that's me. I've been here about 30 years or so. Thanks, Alan. And finally, uh, Leon Walsh. 
Hi, I'm Leon Walsh. I'm the Principal Structural Engineer for Historic England, and I'm also one of the drone pilots. I've worked in engineering consultancies for over 20 years, where I've been specialising in historic buildings for about 15 years. I joined Historic England in 2019, and in 2020, I became one of the drone pilots. Thank you. Thanks, Leon. So as I, I've mentioned, the, the key points of this presentation are how we're using drones to complement and improve workflows that were already being undertaken. So we were already ground-based versions of a lot of the sensors we're, we're using on the drones. So it's really just expanding what we can see, if you like. Um, the breadth of drone applications across historic England. So we haven't just got surveyors, photographers, we've got all sorts going on, using, all using drones and uh, a few case studies to, to give you examples of, of some of those things. So where are we using drones? A little bit out of date now, we've got more than nine. Um, I think we've got a 12 pilots now qualified with a, a GVC or a PFCO. Um, uh, the areas of the business where we're mainly using those are geospatial. So that's mapping of smaller areas, so up to sort of the size of a, an individual field, for example, um, and 3D modeling of structures and buildings. Uh, we've also got archaeology. So again, tends to be smaller areas of mapping and site overview. So relatively easy way to get a, a bird's eye view of a site to judge the context of uh, any archaeology you're doing in the, the We've got public engagement and marketing. So promotional photography for things like guidebooks, publications, uh, websites, you know, all that sort of promotional material you'd expect from a an organization in England. And then we've got the aerial survey team. So that's mapping over a larger area generally. So whole landscapes. And then we can use the drones to, to get a, a finer look at a smaller area from some of the taken by our actual aircraft. And then we've got the structural engineering department. So they're carrying out structural inspections of buildings, you know, looking at the condition of walls, brickwork, mortaring, all that sort of thing. And uh, we'll we'll get some more examples of all of that from the, the various speakers we've got with us today. So we've currently got quite a lot of drones, as you'd imagine, the different areas we're working in. So we've got everything from a mini mini twos and threes up to an M300 and more specialised drones in, in between, like the Elios for confined spaces and things like that. So a lot of drones on the books, a lot of different aircraft, a lot of different things we're using them for. So why, why are we using drones? Well, basically, at a, a fundamental level, it's given us an eye in the sky for capturing low-level aerial imagery of sites. So historically, we'd have to use a a long pole essentially to get a, a camera into the air whereas now we can use it and it's a, a lot easier to do that so we can use that as a platform for undertaking our condition assessments close range inspections so it makes things a lot easier to get up close to things that you can't physically get to normally it can be very fast to deploy so we can get low level aerial imagery very quickly over a relatively large area, which historically would have taken us a lot longer. It would have been a lot more complicated to, to undertake. And provides us with a safe means of accessing potentially areas so we can send a drone in where we don't want to send a person. As you can imagine that a lot of buildings in the sort of heritage environment are potentially unsafe and you don't necessarily want people going in there and got an option to send the drone in and have a look and see what's going on in there and a, a unique vantage point for presenting historic buildings to the public so that's again touching on the promotional aspect of the, the imagery so without further ado we'll jump straight into geospatial survey which is uh, my area of expertise so 
paper, I'm just going to give you a few case studies as examples of the sort of work where we so the first example is a survey we undertook at Mount Grace Priory. So this is um, a Carthusian monastery in uh, north of England. It's one of the most complete ver versions of that building in England. So it's used as a, a type site as a, to work out what's going on on similar sites, basically. Um, founded in 1398 and in the 20th century, it was converted by Lothian Bell. So we undertook some laser scanning and structure for motion photogrammetry. That is a set of overlapping images to produce a, a photorealistic model of the whole of the, the mansion, which is what we were looking at as part of the job. And that's combined with the laser scan to provide the, the geospatial framework for the images to keep everything nice and tightly controlled. And from that, you can produce the reality capture model, which you can see in the bottom right of that slide. And then from there, once you've got a, a 3D model of the structure, you can pull out any elevations and plan views you like. So you can, you've got that photo level of detail, so you can look in the condition of the roof. It's all accurate. You've got the laser scan to back that up. So you can very quickly produce any sort of sections, elevation drawings, plans that you might need from that model. So the second case study is a deserted medal, medieval village, at Gainsthorpe. It's one of the best preserved medieval villages in England. A lot of it is still visible on the ground, so the, the lumps and bumps in the field. So aerial mapping is obviously the uh, the most efficient way to survey the village. And um, this is actually one of the only jobs really where the vast majority of our data was captured using a drone. So again, it was a uh, photogrammetry using the overlapping images. And from that we could uh, draw markers on the ground and very quickly produce a, a 3D model of the, the field showing all of the changes in the ground and the terrain and produce a, a digital which you can see there on the right of that slide and then you can use a further editing of that image to, to really sort of tease out the the undulations in the ground and adjust the shadows and the lightning position Sort of start bringing out features that you can't necessarily see with the naked eye. And then my final case study is Blackfriars Priory. So this is uh, is founded in and again one of the the most complete surviving priories of the Dominicans in England. Uh, again, converted at a later date into a residence. This time by Thomas Bell in 1539. So we were there to undertake a condition assessment as they wanted to develop one of the buildings on the site and the basement was potentially unsafe and so they didn't want to enter or into the basement until they could uh, find out what was going on down there. So we took the Elios 2 to site. Um, that's a cage drone so you can send that into spaces and it doesn't matter whether you hit not the normal state of affairs with the drone. So we can send that into spaces where we don't necessarily know exactly what's going to be happening down there. And uh, there's a couple of stills there from video. So basically with it flying, it's constantly capturing 4K video. And from that, you can pull out stills at uh, whatever time you want to, to pull them out. And then from there, we can use those stills to produce uh, a 3D model. So at the end of that, we've got, it's not as nice as you, you'll see from a, a model with normal photography where you've got time to use a, a tripod, get some nice images. But as you can see, for an area that you can't otherwise physically access, that's a pretty good model. 
and the the colour again is is very reasonable for. So that's a very useful tool now for them to they can go in there, they can look at the imagery, they can look at the video feed and take dimensions from that model all from a space that you can't physically go into. So very useful tool that one to have. And that is the end of the, the geospatial example. So we'll move on to landscape archaeology with Dave Went. Hello there. Um Right, landscape archaeology. This the, the team that I'm engaged with, which I manage. I mean, our basic um, uh, purpose is the uh, is the recording, observation, and mapping and interpretation of earthworks, visible archaeology of one form or another. The sorts of lumps and bumps that Gary was talking about, a gains thought, that sort of thing. You can track back the origins of this through the Royal Commission at Archaeological Surveys going back uh, through the middle part of the last century and even before to the earliest days Please. of antiquity. Hello? Am I, am I being heard okay? I, I've got a bit of cross feed. Okay. Um, yeah, you can track the, the origins of this approach right back to the early antiquarians of even the 17th and 18th century. So it's observation, recording, and interpretation. Uh, we are one of the main exponents of that, but we're not the only ones in British archaeology. And we've always used uh, aerial photography to guide the sort of processes that we do to get that aerial view, but it's usually been aerial photography that's been captured either for other reasons or at a previous occasion, high level from aeroplanes and so forth. But we use that to orientate ourselves on the ground to get a good feel for what's going on before we set up and do our surveys. And over the years, the survey techniques have moved on from uh, tapes and offset through alidades, through uh, theodolites to EDMs to GPS to GNSS and so forth on the ground. But to have that viewpoint from the air that helps you just understand the context of what you're doing is, is invaluable. And we picked up on this um, through working with consultants maybe 10 years ago. And in more recent years, we've started to bring the drone applications in house to help us do the work that we do. And again, we're not the only people in the sector doing that. this, and there are probably several people viewing this presentation who are at least as advanced as us and probably more advanced in some areas of the techniques. Anyway, it gives us the ability to throw a drone in the air and take an instant viewpoint on a site. And this one on the screen at the moment is a, a bit of military training ground down near Gosport. And I'll come back to it later, but even in this low light, slanting light piece of photography, you can see that some of the, the sinuous lines that are giving us thoughts about what the sort of archaeology is. But if I can move on one, Gary, please. Here's a you know, slightly different site. This is um, Ashnot in the forest of Boland, somewhere near Clitheroe in Lancashire. And what we're looking at is a dome of limestone into which there are multitude of holes that have been dug going back to the 16th century and possibly even before, trying to extract the veins and flats of lead out of the hillside here. So it's an early lead mine. It's an evolved lead mine that was still being worked up until the 1830s, I think, from memory. A complicated site. Uh, and again, this is a non-drone piece of aerial photography taken by uh, from a fixed wing aircraft and immediately you start to get an idea of just how busy this is underground it's even more busy this this knoll is like a piece of swiss cheese with every kind of gallery and uh, add it and a uh, sinkhole dropped into it next slide please gary yeah that's just to give the emphasize the point that this is a very ancient mine in this particular landscape. We've got references to it being active as far back as uh, 1590s. And there are suggestions from other sources that it may have been active in the 14th century. So next slide, please, Gary. Part of it's scheduled. Um, I think that scheduling line has slipped slightly to the right from where it should be, but you can see that only a section of the site is scheduled, causing the, the landowners and everybody else a real problem because they want to maintain it. They want to um, ensure that it doesn't get damaged, but they also need to run stock over it. They need to understand where to put fencing around it. How important are the different parts of that landscape? How important, how old are the different elements in that mining minefield of holes and, and pits and, and adits? So we undertake a survey there. Next slide, please, Gary. 
And this was fairly early on, uh, use of drones. In fact, I think we contracted the use of a fixed wing drone, a small one, to actually take the photographs over here. Most of you will be very familiar with the process. It's a, a blanket mapping approach, uh, about 300 aerial photographs overlapping, taken from about 30 meters, 40 meters above the ground level, uh, are tied into uh, accurate control points on the ground in those days before RTK became a possibility for these sorts of things. And from that, you can get a quick, accurate, metrically accurate, and detailed map of the terrain, which is incredibly handy. Uh, next slide, please, Gary. Transferring that into a GIS, this is when we start to apply our process more to this, because a map and a, and a model is, is an excellent thing. But unless you're actually interpreting the archaeology from it, it's just another version of reality. What you need to do is interrogate it for the information that it'll tell you about the past. Having got it into a, in this case, a, I think a CAD environment, uh, we can now, and using the observation from the ground as well, this wasn't purely done by drone, this was using drone in combination with ground bits of ground survey, we can start to map out the features that matter. Next, please, Gary. So onto that uh, LIDAR looking, um, terrain actually created from structure from motion, we can start to trace out what's important about the water features that drained the mines, that led to where they dressed and processed the ore, where they banked up uh, bodies of water in order to service various parts of the mining process. And we can separate that away from the, the green lines on this map, which are simply the field improvement drainage system applied in the late 18th, 18th or early 19th century. Next slide, please, Gary. Onto that, we can actually apply something that looks like our traditional survey uh, depictions. We often use hashes, hasher plans, which you know, have a history going back through the Ordnance Survey and all sorts of other areas to show tops and bottoms of slopes, individual lumps, bumps, mounds, and hollows. This helps us to isolate what is truly archaeological from what is the topography or perhaps later disturbance across the landscape. And ultimately, you can strip away the LIDAR type image. Uh, Gary, please. And we're left with something that looks much more like a traditional earthwork plan, but derived in no small part from the drone imagery that enables us to very clarify the individual features, to start naming them and describing them and putting them into an orderly sequence, talking about the significance of how that mining landscape has developed tremendous stuff. This was a few years ago. We're, we're developing this process further now, and I'll probably be wanting to talk to some of the other archaeological drone flyers uh, fairly shortly about some sessions and conference ideas that we have to sort of pull these ideas together. But that's for another time. Uh, next slide, please, Gary. Right, coming back to that first slide of the uh, military training ground at Gosport, a place called Brown Down. Um, apologies for the slightly various colour scheme that it applied to the vegetation, but you can see how difficult that landscape can be when you're looking for small training type uh, military trenches dating from the First World War primarily. It's, it, you know, it, it's knee deep in bracken. Uh, it was hard to appreciate everything on the ground. But we were, we, again, we applied a, a, a hybrid approach using drones and ground-based survey to get the best out of this landscape. From this, which is a ortho mosaic made up of about six or six and a half hundred photographs, you can already begin to see lines straggling their way through the undergrowth, different shapes and sizes. I can't point to them, I'm afraid, because I don't have control of the, uh, the cursor. But uh, yeah, down there, Gary, where you've got the cursor left a bit, that's fine. There's one sinuous line. And there are many others in this landscape. Just as an example, Gary, if we move to the next slide, and forget about the ortho photography as a mosaic, but start treating it as a terrain map and putting on 16 direction hillshade, suddenly those lines become a lot more clear and easy to read. The sinuous ones Gary was pointing to down to the sort of bottom left, those are practice trenches for going between the front line where you would have a crenellated or Greek key type um, um, trenches, the idea being that the setbacks along the line prevented bomb damage or explosions from causing a sort of mass casualties right across the line. So you have right angle bends giving you bomb deflection and, and shelter. 
But as you go back through from the front line to the rear lines, they become more sinuous because they have to move equipment up and down and right angle bends are a real pain. And of course, you've got to bring back stretched casualties as well. So again, the sinuous lines help. And across this landscape, you go a bit further up to the top right where the track is crossing, you can see myriad versions of the frontline trenches that they were digging with different platoons to prepare them for when they began to sent overseas to the Western Front in 1915, 1916, and so forth. Very, very handy stuff. I think that might be my last slide. No, I've got another one. Please, next, Gary. A separate case study, um, just a piece of work along 600 yards of a uh, military rail a railway, not military, a uh, mineral railway line on the North York Moors up near Rosedale. These mineral railway lines were set up in the mid 19th century to um, supply ironstone primarily to the big smelting works uh, from between the mines and the quarries and the smelting works. And this particular line survived in use until the 19, late 1920s. It's now a really popular walkers route because it's a leveled gradient that takes you around some of the most spectacular parts of the North York Moors. But it's suffering from all sorts of erosion issues some caused by the walkers, some caused simply because it's not being maintained any longer. So drainage systems and everything else are backed up, areas of it are flooding and so forth. The uh, park authority really wanted to improve the pathways through this area. They wanted this particular area looking at because they were concerned that the routes that they'd chosen for the paths might actually be interfering not only with the railway, but potentially with much earlier mining remains that had been clipped by the line. So again, drone gives you a very quick and very accurate way of, uh, of uh, capturing that terrain. Next slide, please. So there we go, another 16 direction piece of hill shade on top of structure from motion, Agisoft software um, processing of a, uh, a drone mapping flight. You can see the, the sinuous line of the, uh, the railway. You can see that whole row of uh, dumps and bumps along the uh, southern edge as you go into the second part to the south of the line. That's what they were concerned about. Were those late medieval mining remains that had been cut by the railway or were they just products of the railway? And this helped to capture that. And we went from this sort of imagery to the next slide, please, Gary, where we were able to pick out using ground-based observation as well, exactly the processes that were involved there, what had happened. These were in fact just part of the process of developing the railway line. They had nothing to do with earlier mining quite evidently finger dumps and, and uh, waste products from creating the, uh, the cutting the railway once sat within and is now full of water because all the railway drainage systems have been blocked for decades and decades. But that helped them to decide exactly where to put the line. So I think that's my last slide, Gary, but uh, yeah. move along, thank you very much. So moving on to aerial survey with Dave Knight. Thank you. Um, so yeah, we, we do kind of mirror some of the work across the organization to some degree, but aerial survey, rather than being site specific, we do deal with uh, very large landscapes. And we've obviously got a, we've got a history of using aerial photographs that can go back a century, over a century, um, captured by balloon photography, early um, monoplanes, biplanes, even pigeons were used to capture <laughs> photographs at one time. Um, but of course, the platforms change over time. Um, one of the things that we started using as uh, kind of an additional data set, probably about 20 years ago when we first started using it, is LIDAR. And then that was our first real introduction to digital elevation models. Um, so it, was, it soon became evident, basically, the drone was going to provide another platform for that and allow us to uh, take that uh, kind of technology further in order to pull the most out of the archaeology. Um, now, so forgive me for the um, remarkably blurred screen. It's not your eyesight. It is just an example of uh, a close-up of Bird Oswald Roman Fort. And to show you the kind of the contrast between the different data sets that we might use when we're actually conducting some archaeological mapping. So in this first instance, we're looking at only one meter resolution environment agency. Um, there is now, um, environment agency LIDAR available for the entire country. Uh, when this project was conducted, there wasn't, and so it was quite patchy. Um, so you basically get what you can get, and it's usually only supplied at one meter. Sometimes you get higher resolutions uh, along uh, rivers and such, um, 
which are of interest to the Environment Agency. Now, one metre resolution looks very, very fuzzy in this image, but actually for us, for large earthworks, it works quite well. If you have a very broad bank field system, you can pick them out quite well on one metre. Um, if you can just go to the next slide, please, Gary. So what we tried to play around with, our first kind of use of structure from motion within the organisation was actually using um, aerial reconnaissance uh, photography. So we have we had two aircraft within the organisation, one based in the south, one in the north. Um, and uh, in this instance, our pilot literally went along, up and down the valley uh, around Bird Oswald several times with his camera poked out of the window, just taking a series of uh, overlapping oblique shots. And the result was actually remarkably good. Um, and it provided uh, a fantastic landscape model, which we could then use to interpret archaeological earthworks. And next slide, please, Gary. And then just to emphasize, obviously, something you all obviously realize is the kind of level of detail you'll be getting with drones that if you want to get that detail you can get down to um, a, a centimeter um, kind of resolution um, to be honest for us um, that resolution looks absolutely fantastic for stone work it's actually far too noisy for picking up earthworks we usually decimate that data down to a minimum of around about 10 centimeters because the vegetation just gets in the way um, down to uh, grass and anything small like that but it just shows you the kind of different detail that we might be using. So if we can go to the next slide, please, Gary. Um, so at the time this project was undertaken, we've got three primary data sets given as elevation models. We've got uh, the LIDAR, uh, we've got uh, the structure from motion from the aerial reconnaissance photography, uh, which is around about, I think, 18 centimeter resolution. LIDAR was one meter resolution. And then we had some drone um, photography at this time commissioned. We've since been back. Um, uh, with our own drones to uh, do some more survey up there, um, down to about two centimeter resolution. Now these all have their, they all have their benefits. Now the aerial reconnaissance SFL was the first time we played with it. Uh, the technology, um, it worked very well, but it was also down, um, limited by the quality of the photography. We wanted to capture the author photograph, which was probably the most important thing for us at that time. So we were using good light, so we had shadow, we had, um, nice kind of rolling hills and so the shadow obviously can cause problems with the structure from motion process but it showed up a lot more than we've seen before it also covered the entire project area the environment agency at that lidar was limited to one meter resolution and didn't cover the entire area but actually picked up things that we were then seeing in shadow and the recce photography and then we bring in the drone imagery using the drone imagery on top of this we can get a lot more detail for the areas where we need to, whether it's the stonework around the actual fort itself, some of the more um, uh, finer earthworks around the fort. Um, and it brings up that uh, we can obviously bring, uh, we can get a resolution of whatever we want, basically. If we create a resolution of 10 centimeters, that's ample for recording any of the finest of earthworks. So despite them all being very different. Um, I, 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 the drone is a fantastic tool, but it cannot replace the others, and nor can they the drone. So they all complement each other one in, in their own way. Um, now, I haven't actually put any ortho photography on here. Obviously, aerial photography is our key resource and always has been since day one when we were established many, many years ago. Um, but the ortho photography put together with all of these data sets. Next slide, please, Gary. Um, basically it helps us then to produce this archaeological mapping of a landscape. So unlike um, Dave's T-hashed plans that he was showing you, um, we, we map to a slightly uh, a smaller scale. We, we, I wouldn't say schematically, we, we, back in the olden days, we used to sketch plot. Now everything is, is, uh, uh, is digitally rectified. Um, obviously the use of drone and various TNSS technologies and such make that are a lot more accurate than we've ever been in the past. But we can map all these landscapes to slightly lesser date, detail than Dave uh, and his team do. But we cover obviously the entire landscape um, in that period of time. Um, this uh, kind of archaeological mapping then becomes publicly available. Um, uh, some of you may be aware of last year, we released the um, Aerial Archaeology Mapping Explorer. Um, and that allows us to actually produce the, this mapping out into the public domain so people can see it there. Um, always accompanied by uh, research reports, so you've got a lot of archaeological detail in the background for sites. Um, also with attribute data and such, so you can always trace back where um, things were mapped from. 
Um, also, I should probably mention that, you know, a lot of this imagery, potentially, we, we also have the Aerial Photo Explorer, which is where a lot of our aerial reconnaissance imagery gets uploaded to for the public uh, to use. Um, but in the future, there's a potential that we will probably be doing a similar thing with the, uh, the drone ortho photograph. So that will, all, again, be publicly viewable. Next slide, please, Gary. And just to kind of round up on the, um, the aerial side of things. So going back to our very first dealings with digital elevation models, of course, we, we, uh, we've got the Environment Agency LIDAR. We used to commission it in for various projects. Um, it was a very expensive job at the time. Uh, 10,000 pound, probably just put an aircraft in the air to do bespoke LIDAR projects, but we would be getting LIDAR data at, uh, say, 10 centimeter resolution. Obviously, these days, everything's changed. Now that we have drone mounted LIDAR, um, it enables us to undertake um, our own more bespoke surveys as well. Um, so this is this is uh, is quite new in house. Obviously, lidar, uh, a drone lidar has been around for quite a while now, but we we are only just starting to use it in house. But um, we're going to obviously use it much more tied in with aerial survey projects. So when we're getting sites which are difficult to really get any detail of, uh, maybe the lidar doesn't cover it very well, or the lidar was taken at the wrong time of the year. This is where we can then use those drones to get out there, maybe midwinter, potentially see under a bit of deciduous tree coverage when the foliage is off, um, get a bit more detail for certain sites. Uh, we view the data differently. So we, we do all the mapping in the GIS space. Um, we view the live data in uh, uh, quick terrain and um, other programs, software like that. And then we do various visualizations uh, using Relief Visualization Toolbox, which is a very useful tool, whether it's, um, so these are created in 2D uh, raster uh, visualizations, but whether we're using 16 direction hill shade or, or, um, uh, or, or local relief model, things like that. That's the kind of visualizations that we use that help emphasize the earthworks and allow us to draw that extra detail out. And that's me finished. I will pass on to Leon. Thanks, Dave. Uh, I'm going to move on to Alan now to talk through what he does with uh, public engagement and marketing. You're on mute, Alan. Thank you very much. Just like to say how delighted I am to have been asked to come and talk today. Uh, about the work I do for Historic England and English Heritage Trust. So uh, largely my work is ground-based, so pictorial photography uh, for guidebooks, academic books, uh, media releases, BBC, Times, Guardian, that type of thing. Um, so it's quite different from the work that my esteemed colleagues have been showing us this morning. Um, back in 1988, when I was a student, we were asked to draw a name out of a top hat, fittingly, and I picked out Felix Tornichon, who was the first person ever to do any aerial photography in the world. So he sent up his great big hot air balloon over Paris, and uh, I was mesmerised by his bravery. Um, and little did I know, you know, 30, 40 years later, that I'd be, then I was in college, I'd be uh, doing some aerial work myself, and it's really opened up a whole new world for me. Uh, another hero of mine is uh, Henri Cartier-Bresson, who talked about the decisive moment uh, where your all the planets line up and you've got that one split second to get your shot. And this is what we're doing all the time with uh, the weather. So previous weather, as you can see here, that's still shown the snow, the current weather. At that moment, the direction of the light on the, on the keep and the cathedral, but we've got a big snowstorm coming in and all those things lined up, it wasn't too windy, um, all lined up for that one moment. So we're constantly thinking about all these different factors just for that split second image, which is kept in the archive for future generations. Um, so I'd just like you to bear that in mind all the way through here with, it's the same process all the way through the direction of the light, the quality of the light, whether it's soft or hard, um, and all has to come into play for a, a, for a good image. Okay, next slide, please, Gary. Here we are in Bishop Auckland. Um, in years gone by, I'd have been standing up on a big step ladders with a 5.4 camera 
um, as Nadal would have been doing himself, Felix Tornchon. Um, but now I can send the drone up and I can be uh, where I want to be rather than lower, uh, looking up at buildings with tilt shift lenses. So my aim is to be halfway up a building by and large, um, rather than looking up or down or oblique or, or vertical, it gives a really nice pure look and it's what we're after. So here I've waited for um, not shadowy light, soft enough, but still with some direction. Um, there's still color in there. So all these factors have lined up and I've actually asked this lady to walk down the street, straight down the middle. So um, I'm kind of controlling some of what's going on uh, by asking somebody to go through, but choosing when to do it is, is key. Um, so now I'll be doing drone flights sort of between three and nine meters up largely. So using a sub 250 gram drone so I can be really sort of up close and intimate. Okay, next slide, please. Okay, here we are um, in Bishop Auckland again. So this was going to be the book cover. And as I was about to photograph this, this tractor came through with hay bales on, um, which explains in one view uh, the, what goes on with the landscape around the, the town that was built on mining. So that serendipitous moment is really important uh, to show in one view what might be going on in that town or area. Next slide, please. So the drone work is largely to uh, complement the ground photography I do. Um, so this job here, the shot on the left was all about the people who are going to be doing historic uh, conservation work. So here they're learning how to bend lead for roofing and they did glazing, uh, putting gold leaf on orbs, uh, roofing, all kinds of historic trades which are disappearing. So the job was about these people, but I also wanted to show the context and the building that they're going to be working on. This is Wentworth Woodhouse. So the drone was perfect for that because you could get a little bit higher only a few meters so you can see the building and the, and the people doing the work. Um, but looking down on people, you rarely get that sort of sense of mm, sort of connection with people unless they're at a wedding and looking up and waving or something. But for the kind of work we do, um, it's good to be down lower and close in with people working to show, show that, that real connection. Okay, but the drone is, is essential in, in putting that context in. Next slide, please. Uh, continuing the Wentworth Woodhouse theme, this is uh, Keppel's Column, which looks out over the Wentworth Woodhouse landscape, as it were. And just like to show here how important it is for us to um, try and be halfway up a building. So in the past, we'd have shot this from the ground and we wouldn't have seen the base very clearly. It would have all been distorted and converging. So this is 35 meters high. So if I've got the drone sort of halfway up, it's, um, it's, it's got a good, a good shape to it. Um, and within a couple of shots, you can get the gist of how that, that structure works. Okay, next slide, please. Here we are in Bishop Auckland again. This is the town hall uh, showing halfway up again. Uh, and I'm setting the spirit level on the drone to zero degrees. It's very important this. And then I'm using the drone's um, altitude to get the building in the frame. So I'm not pointing the camera up and down. I'm setting it to zero and then using the actual drone's movement to get the building in shot. So we're always trying to keep clean skies, no big cubulonimbus clouds. So something smooth like this in the background is good, uh, especially with um, decorative features like the finials on the roof. Um, so we're always looking for clear sky. Um, so and then we're looking for the traffic as well. You might want traffic in, out, people in, out, depending on what the brief is. Um, so again, everything has to line up. Um, they wanted the, the Auckland Tower in the back with the town hall. Uh, often very difficult because it's shadowy, especially this time of year with low light. But um, 
All we're trying to do is replicate what I would do on the ground. As the example on the right shows, I'm halfway up that little barn in Derbyshire. Um, I'm just doing all the same principles. So camera plane is, is, is vertical, uh, just the same. The only benefits of being on the ground is that on grey overcast days, I can put location lights in and then get light in, which obviously I can't do with the drones that I'm using, uh, the small sub 250 gram drones. But in future, I'm hoping to light bigger buildings uh, by using a camera with a, a payload with a hot shoe, and I can radio sync lights, but that's a future project. Next slide, please. Okay, so here we are. Not only are we halfway up this building, this is Morecambe Winter Gardens, but I'm halfway along pretty well. Um, although that finial doesn't quite line up with the, the central window bar. But to all intents and purposes, we're halfway up, halfway along. And that gives you a really pure view of how that building looks. So I was here a few weeks ago to um, document the interior, which just had £680,000 spent uh, conserving and restoring the plaster work, which had been damaged, um, which included, uh, next slide, please, Gary. Next slide, please, Gary. Yeah, that should have gone. Okay, oh, good. So it included um, shots of the mosaic floor, which they're hoping to um, get some money for. So they need to put a bid in, but they need evidence of the damage that's, that's occurring. So the Victoria Pavilion, that's the, the very first bit you come to. Um, the only way you can shoot that is with a drone. Um, you can't even put a, a gantry in because the legs would be coming down. It's a really tight space, probably about a metre and a, well, a metre 20 wide um, between the bars and the door. So that was, that was interesting. So um, ha you have to turn off the return to home because you don't want it losing signal and then flying up into the ceiling. Um, so that was, that was quite a crucial thing to do for that shot. And also the shot on the right, so that's a little bit further into the, the doorway there. You can see from that one shot the damage that's occurred with the mosaic tiles and the sort of attempted repair that needs redoing. So, so this is going to be used as evidence as to why they need money to to restore the uh, the historic fabric. Okay, next slide, please. Okay, so it's very important to keep an eye on, keep tabs on what's happening to landscapes. Uh, this is ninety degrees from the the Winter Gardens, looking out to the Midland Hotel in Morecambe. And this whole area here was once a Lido, the green area, or to the right, a car park uh, with the funfair on. Uh, this is going to be the location for the next Eden project. So this view is not going to be around for very long, but um, I knew before I went that that was the case. So I made sure that I got a shot of that for, uh, for the archive. Next slide, please. So we still do a lot of uh, work for English Heritage Trust, so guidebooks for them. Uh, this is work for the latest Brough and Broom Castles guidebook. This is up in Cumbria. Uh, and just to show how within a couple of shots you can get a good, good idea of how a, a site looks. So on the left, you've got the form and shape st structure of the, the castle. And just to the south of that, you've got the Roman fort, which doesn't really show up on the oblique, and it certainly doesn't show up when you're on the ground. It just looks like any other field. But uh, the shot on the left, I was very lucky that I could go up to 120 metres maximum flight altitude, and all that just fitted in. So it was, it was perfect, really. And then the shot on the right, just to, just to put the context and... Uh, the height of the keep and all the rest of it you can get from that shot, which complements all the ground photography that I did on site there. Okay, uh, next slide, please, Gary. Here's an example of um, some grotesques on a Bruff Castle, uh, sorry, Broom Castle. One from the ground on the left with a 300 millimeter lens, and the one on the right level with the drone. Now, if I bought the guidebook, 
and I'm looking at that picture, the one on the left from the ground tells me I need to be looking up to find those features. So if I was a picture editor, I'd be using the left hand one uh, as opposed to the right hand one, which slightly misleads you into thinking those features are at head height. So despite these things being 10, 12 meters up, uh, I think it's better to use the left hand image with a slightly upward viewpoint. Uh, okay, next slide, please. Okay, this is uh, Gainsborough Old Hall. So this is a guidebook shot. I was asked primarily for the shot on the left, an interior view of the solar gallery, which was difficult balancing everything up, but I thought, wouldn't it be great if I could just go and do a mirror image of that window from outside so we can see the structure of the fabric um, both inside and out without making it look like it's a drone shot. So that's what I'm trying to do a lot of the time is just not trying to make it look like a drone shot. Um, and that's what I've tried to do here. Next shot, please. Okay, more things to line up with the planets. Uh, not only is the weather, the light, the clouds, the flap of the flag there, the birds on the water, the birds in the sky, all these things have to line up, but we need to bear in mind that these are going to be used for book covers. Very often, one on the left is a possible Bishop Auckland con um, informed conservation book cover. The one on the right is the Brough and Broom guidebook. So we need to be always thinking top and bottom, keeping it clean so we can add, or the graphic designers can add text before going to print. Uh, the shot on the right, I shot with the drone and also with a standard camera uh, because I, I've got some elevation from the bridge over the river here um, and in the end chose to use the one on the, the normal camera purely because the resolution was was higher but the drone was in the same position um, so there was no benefit to using the drone. Next shot please. This is my last one so this is uh, Church of St Paul and Peter on the Wirral and <clears throat> they've just had their dome conserved. So my, my task was primarily to do a portrait of the, the, the canon inside in his cassock, um, which we did. A uh, lovely French man then said, ah, would you like to go on the roof? So great, it was too windy to send the drone up. It was off the scale windy. Um, so I'd written off anything really close up of the dome. So the next thing we're going up three floors, up the ladder, out through the hatch. Um, he'd gone first, and then I came out, and then the zip on the camera bag got snagged in the pigeon netting. So he climbed up the ladder and undid it, <laughs> climbed back down, and the next thing, he's up on this barrel vaulted roof, uh, taking photos, sending texts, waving at his friends, and I was just terrified just to let go of the railing on the little platform I was on, but managed to get the shot that I wanted to do initially with the drone, but did it with the standard camera, holding the camera and then a flash big, big location uh, light uh, to light him up um, and got, got the shots through a different, different method. So, uh, so, but that's, that's the way it was and it was great. And then on the way down, uh, a huge puff of wind came as he was on the ladder, which blew his cassock up over his shoulders. But I uh, was very professional and, uh, didn't press the button. So uh, that was my day on the Wirral. And uh, that's that's my talk. Thank you very much. Thank you, Alan. And last but not least, we've got Leon, who's gonna talk you through how he's using drones in structural engineering. Hi, thanks, Gary. I've been flying drones as a hobbyist for a number of years and I've seen their potential for assisting with structural inspections. Using a drone allows the engineer to visually inspect parts of a building not easily seen from ground level without the need for scaffolding or an elevated platform. I fly the Mavic 2 Enterprise Dual, which is equipped with a visual and a thermal camera. The thermal camera can uh, help detect temperature differentials, highlighting where there may be cooler areas of the structure potentially indicating dampness. It can also be fitted with a cage and spotlights allowing safe use within buildings or structures. 
Often, particularly with historic structures, the erection of scaffolding or access by a cherry picker may cause damage to the historic asset or may be difficult due to the height of the structure, the surrounding topography or adjacent buildings. Although the use of a drone allows a visual inspection, it can quickly highlight areas which may require further more detailed inspection. For structural engineering inspections, um, in most cases, only photographs and video are required, although photogrammetry and laser scans can produce fantastically detailed digital models, which have many uses. I just use the drone as an eye in the sky, giving me a close-up image of a difficult to reach area or, or general overview of a structure. Remote inspection drones can be very useful as well uh, when inspecting dangerous or difficult to access structures such as the Elios 2. Um, the cage drones can be flown within buildings, tunnels, wells, culverts, factory chimneys, or in rooms where the floor is not safely accessible. Next slide, please, Gary. There are some advantages and disadvantages with using the drone for structural inspections. Um, they are cost effective. So the initial purchase and training costs are soon recouped when you consider the cost of an access scaffold or a cherry picker hire. The planning and preparation for a flight typically takes about an hour, uh, but once on site, the drone can be quickly launched and the information obtained much quicker than it would be from a mobile platform or a scaffold. It's also safer to fly a drone as there's no working at height restrictions for the individuals, although we are obviously very mindful of our surroundings and fly safely. The imagery is clear and uh, very helpful. Um, and also the, the, the video footage can be gathered for a particular area that you're interested in. Access by an elevated platform may not be possible around the whole perimeter of the building or structure, whereas there are no restrictions in the air apart from the obvious trees and other potential hazards. In some situations, you, you do actually need to physically touch the structure uh, to determine the extent of rot in a timber element or the depth of a crack within stonework. And unfortunately, a drone isn't able to do that. So you do have to have sort of hands-on uh, inspection. In some locations, further permissions may be required, such as the urban or sensitive areas, uh, which can extend the planning process, but it's still much quicker than organising a cherry picker and uh, or scaffolding. Flights may also be limited by the weather. Strong wind or rain will prevent inspection taking place on a particular day, uh, but it would have to be rearranged for better weather, which is still much cheaper and easier than uh, rearranging a cherry picker. Next slide, please, Gary. I'll now show you a couple of areas uh, where the drone's been used for structural inspections. Here in the photograph on the, on the left, you can see that although the, from the ground, it was obvious that the chimney pot had partially fallen into the chimney, um, the, expend, the extent of repair required and the stability of the pot could not be confirmed from the ground. On the photograph on the right, um, you can see the defect was not visible at all from the ground, but will clearly allow a significant amount of water ingress into the building through the chimney stack. You can use a drone to confirm what you can see from the ground and discover what you cannot see from the ground. Next slide, please, Gary. Here we've got um, the West Tower at Furness Abbey in Cumbria, which has recently had soft capping applied to the wall heads, as you can see here in the um, before and after photographs. So the soft capping is basically um, a layer of vegetation which protects the wall head. The drone allows us to monitor the growth of the capping and ensure that it takes hold and protects the wall head as it should. We can also check um, very easily the, um, how it's performing in, in different seasons of the year. Um, and as you can see from the photograph there, the, when the work was carried out, it had a full scaffold, um, but obviously for the inspection, it would be very expensive and time consuming to erect a scaffold and it is not accessible by a cherry picker. Next slide, please. So in this inspection at, um, at Carlisle Castle, uh, I was asked to check the roof covering and the parapet gutter, which was not visible from the ground. Given the proximity of the other buildings and the castle wall, the use of a mobile platform wasn't possible. The only way we could have um, inspected the, the gutter behind the parapet was either actually getting up on the roof and walking around, or by erecting a scaffold which would completely encapsulate the building. Both alternatives have their own risks, 
um, and cost implications. But using the drone, I was able to highlight areas where repairs may be required and likely locations for the water ingress, which was damaging the interior of the building. Um, so in summary, the previous slides show a few uh, applications for the engineering inspections for historic buildings. Um, and the, the drone is a fantastic tool for allowing that. Okay, cheers, Gary. Thanks, Liam. So that's, uh, that's the end of our presentation. I hope everyone's found that interesting, seeing the, the, the uses that we've found for drones across the organisation. And um, I know we're, we're getting off the time now, I think, but if anyone's got any quick questions, I guess we can do that now. So we have a question in from Ada saying, very interesting, for external surveys, you can see that wind and light would affect when in the year or during the day drone surveying can be done. Can you go into a bit more details how and what goes into planning prior to doing the surveys? Yeah. So before we undertake a survey, we do a, a pre-site assessment which is basically looking at the airspace restrictions over the, the site we want to fly at, um, whether there's any habitation and rights of way go in the area. So are we expecting there to be lots of people or traffic around? Because obviously there's things that you need depending on the, the drone you're using. So that would you know, inform our decision as to whether we're going to use a Mini 2 there's going to be people everywhere whether we can use something like the m300 because it's going to be a fairly remote site and we're not expecting um and then obviously you're checking the weather forecast to to pick a day when you're likely to be able to fly and then once you've done all that once you get to site then you do a sort of on the ground assessment anything with your your pre-site ass assessments you know there's maybe trees that you weren't anticipating being quite so big when you get to site. There's there's huge trees everywhere. So yeah, so pre-site get as much information as you can before you get there. Make sure you're allowed to fly. Get the permission of the landowner, and then once you at site, another assessment just to make sure you haven't missed anything. There's nothing you weren't expecting. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Gary. Uh... Next, we have from Dorian. Thank you. That was a really fascinating insight into how you're exploiting drones across so many areas of your operations. I'm wondering, have you done any work to assess the time, cost and safety benefits of using drones versus traditional tools and methods? Uh, we haven't done anything directly on that. I wouldn't say, and certainly not in my case, the drones don't save us any time at all because we were already doing, say, the laser scanning and the ground photography. We just weren't able, in most cases, to capture sort of aerial photography of the roof. So it's actually added to our jobs because it's an extra stage in the process, but it's improved the quality of the product. So it hasn't saved us time, but we're getting a better model out because we're now filling in those voids were inevitably there when we're capturing everything from the ground. I don't know yeah. what else has got anything to add there. If I could just add, I mean, we are thinking about this in terms of archaeology and how that's captured. Of course, uh, to do a traditional earthwork survey with boots on ground of a large, complicated monument might take a couple of people, a couple of weeks even, um, you know, walking every earthwork, making every record. The, the digital modeling we can do is obviously you know a matter of minutes in the air and you know some hours in pro processing but the question is are we getting the same level of interpretation by simply capturing an image as we are thoroughly investigating a site at ground level and we're looking at the hybrid nature of how we might develop this in future so we get cost savings in terms of time improvements in terms of our visual output but we still maintain that level of interrogation and observation that is key, absolutely key to actually creating an archaeological interpretation rather than just a jolly nice model. Fantastic. Uh, I've got a couple of people saying thank you very much. And uh, what an interesting delivery of all that you do. Keep up the hard work. 
Um, and uh, thanks for, um, from Andy, thanks for a great presentation. For high accuracy measured building surveys, would you consider using a drone or is the laser scanner still vastly superior in terms of data quality? He's thinking of exterior walls rather than roof areas. It depends what you want to see really. If you're just looking at the shape and form of the building, then I would say the scanning because it's very easily controlled and defined the accuracy you can achieve. Um, if you want to start seeing the sort of photo realistic textures, so looking at brick and, and things like that, then probably photography is, uh, is something you can use either separately or in combination with the laser scanning, because obviously the, the technique we're using with the reality capture, you get the best of both worlds, you get the control of and, you know, and the, the texture of the photography. I mean, that being said, depending on how accurate you need to be, you can produce a model from just the photos. Just it depends what level of accuracy. And then we have, uh, I'm going to encourage people to come up with any last questions, but in the meantime, um, if one wanted to learn to work DEM slash DSM uh, the way you do, what advice would you give for making topographical, historical distinctions, etc.? Uh, probably sounds like a question for Dave Went, I think, if you're distinct. Either me or Dave Knight. I mean, um, you need in order to get both DSM and DTM, in order to strip back to get down to a terrain model, you have to be flying really with LIDAR equipment rather than structure from motion photogrammetry because photogrammetry can't see through uh, the vegetation uh, unless there's a gap in the vegetation uh, large enough to sort of really take some pixels down to the ground level, whereas LIDAR can get a scattering of, of shots through through a canopy and we can use algorithms to go for first or later returns and strip down to get a, a, a more rudimentary but possibly useful uh, plan of the of the ground surface. But it's LIDAR rather than SFM at the moment that enables you to do that. Um, again, it's uh, for creating tra uh, terrain models. It's basically just making sure that you're flying at the right height and that you're getting uh, you, the, the conditions are good for flying, that you're getting the, the coverage and the overlaps that you need, maybe 60% overlaps on photographs in order to get a uh, sufficient um, purchase on the, on the photogrammetry to get really good results down to, you know, in our case, sometimes two, three centimeter resolution, 10 centimeter resolution is best for earthworks. It's It's not well, speaking as a as a as a non technological person who comes from a sort of more archaeological stone age in terms of tools, um, even I found it reasonably possible to assimilate these skills. But it does it does require a bit of time and some training and some understanding of fundamental principles. Excellent, thank you, David. And a question from Adam Stanford. We are using UAS photogrammetry, SFM, to record earthworks, historic buildings and excavations in GIS to produce interpretive reports, etc. We're also applying this technique with other sensors, such as multispectral and thermal. Are Historic England looking at other sensor results to interpret the archaeology? For well, archaeology, um, we haven't done a... a a vast range of techniques yet. Um, we have the ability to use uh, thermal imaging and things like that, but that's largely been applied to buildings and so forth by our technical colleagues in geospatial rather than archaeology. But we're trying to keep up with the uh, the advances in their technology. We know several people in the field that we are shadowing and watching to see how they're doing with uh, different spectrum bands of photography and so forth. Um, I may well be in touch, Adam, at some point in the not too or distant future, because I think we want to run some sessions on this sort of applications in archaeology, and I would very much um, welcome your participation if you feel so minded sometime early next year. Great. Thank you. Uh, and Adam says he'd be very happy with that. Super. Thank you. Do you know each other already? If not, I can... Adam, if you're okay, I will pass details on to David.
that'd be That's good. Okay. That'd be great. Okay. Lovely. Well, uh, Adam says that'd be great. I'll do so. <laughs> uh, well, thank you very much, uh, everyone, both for attending and coming along, but more importantly to the Historic England drone team, because I think I was fascinated, uh, gripped by all the different ways you use them, whether it was the the detail and, and almost top tips from Alan in, in framing photos and what to look for and, and how to use sort of existing photographic techniques through to the detail and the and what we can learn from the archaeological side of things, the the importance of the structural engineering side of it, and all put together to conserve the wonderful buildings and landscape that we are so blessed with in, in the UK, well, in particular England. Um, can I ask, as a matter of interest also, is how much you collaborate with other drone teams, particularly in sort of the, sort of the conservation sphere? I haven't at all, I don't know about the others, but uh, no. Well, let's see what we can do to help with that. We have a, uh, a geospatial framework mm -hmm. for contractors to apply for annually so, uh, obviously do all of the, the work for all of the historic properties in in England so there, there are opportunities to to work on the framework commercially for operators and um, when we do contract in the services of specialists particularly where the drone requirements are outside of our particular expertise or our range of experience so you know people who, who have um, better for qualifications for working close to uh, active rail lines, that sort of thing. Um, you know, it, it makes no sense for us to spend our time becoming that proficient in those areas when there are people who are perfectly capable of contracting to those jobs. That's uh, That sounds an extremely sensible way of, of operating indeed. Well, I'm going to iterate what a number of people here have said, and, and thank you. I've learned a lot. I don't know about anybody else. I'm sure everyone has. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you to our attendees for coming along this lunchtime. And uh, do stay in touch. We have, in a couple of weeks' time, we have Texo talking about the safe adoption, or oh, sorry, the adoption of drones in the oil and gas industry, rather at uh, opposite ends of, of the industry spectrum to today's uh, uh, presentation. But thank you very much indeed. Okay. Oh, so I'm on to, I've got two questions that have popped up. Uh, but two people saying thank you very much. Wonderful. You're very welcome. <laughs> thank you very much. And for those who haven't been able to attend or if you have colleagues who weren't able to attend, this session has been recorded and will be available in due course on the website. Okay. Thank you very much then. Goodbye, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.